If I had just one last opportunity to speak with these people that I love, but I'm going to be separated from them for a while, what would I say? How would I prepare for that? And if I had this one last opportunity, one last opportunity to pray for them, how would I pray? I would make sure that whatever I said really was meaningful, that each one of those words had a lot of thought into it. And, and I would make sure that I, I would pray about the prayer and I would prepare it. You know, Jesus spent that last night before he was betrayed with his disciples. Wouldn't it be wonderful if we had the text of what he actually said? Believe it or not, we really do. Starting from chapter 13 of the book of John, we have those scenes where Jesus gave his teaching on that last night before he died. That was what was on his mind as he's facing the cross. And What if we had that prayer that he prayed for his disciples as he's facing the cross? Well, we do. Is John chapter 17. And I want to say that that's my favorite passage of the whole scriptures. John chapter 17. Because I think we have the bulk of what Jesus prayed for his disciples. As he knows all the while that he knows that his, the, the world of his disciples is going to be turned upside down. And he's looking at the cross. He knows he has to physically leave them for a little while. How does he pray for these people that he poured his life into for three full years? We have that in John chapter 17. And I think in that prayer, Jesus really does give to us the gospel. That the gospel is contained right here. You can correct me if, you, if I'm wrong, but I think really the core of this prayer is in, is, is in uh, verse 23. You can see it. Um, let me just read it for you. I in them and you in me, that they may be made perfectly one, that the world may know that you have sent me and have loved them as you have loved me. Here in this verse I see, and this whole text, I see three things. And they can be summarized this way. Worship, oneness, witness. First there's worship. All throughout this text, there is love pulsating between the Father and the Son. He repeats it over and over and over again. You have loved me. I have loved you. You have loved me before the foundation of the world. Father, glorify your Son. I have glorified you. Mutual glory going back and forth and love relationship that has lasted from all of eternity. It's worship. First of all, there's worship. Secondly, there's oneness. I in them and you in me, that they may be made perfectly one. A little bit earlier he says that they may be one, that the disciples may be one, that the church may be one, just as you and I are one. As the Father and the Son are one, Jesus is praying that his disciples might be united as one, so closely united that they could be called one. That's Jesus' prayer. This is the vision that Jesus has as he is going to the cross. This is what Jesus dies for. And this, I want to tell you, is the gospel. The gospel, I define it this way. It's the costly yet free invitation to the loving lordship community of the Trinity. It's the costly yet free invitation to the loving lordship community of the Trinity. It'll take another video to actually unpack that a little bit. But let me leave that out there for just a minute. I know that's different than what you're used to. I'm not saying that's how the gospel needs to be explained. But if you're going to define what Jesus is, is doing here, what, what he is going for, put together the gospel in a sentence. I think that would be it. It's the costly yet free invitation to the loving lordship community, that oneness of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Jesus, through the cross, he pays for your sins and mine so that we might be united to him in such a way that in him we are united to the Father by the power and in the embrace of the Holy Spirit. That's the gospel. 
Actually, if you read the, the rest of the book of rest of the New Testament, especially in the book of Acts, as the history of the church unfolds, is the love of God is spreading out more and more. This loving lordship community of the Trinity being stretched and spread out. If you go to the book of Ephesians, all throughout the Trinity is woven throughout that letter. And one of the wonderful things that unfolds throughout that letter is the coming together of the Gentile church with the Jewish church. They're coming together. They are becoming one, or that oneness is being displayed better. That's what that was. Ta- that that's what. Uh, uh, it, that's a better way to put that. And then that mystery, as that unfolds, that oneness as it comes together, has all kinds of implication. For the church, as the church expresses the oneness that she shares with the Father through the husband and wife relationship in the family, that oneness in the workplace, that oneness then in the world. That's the book of Ephesians in a nutshell. The Gentiles, the Jews, all the other people of the world coming together, experiencing that oneness in such a way and in every sphere of life in such a way that then becomes a witness to the world. And that's the last part. Worship, oneness, witness. It says here that they may become perfectly one, that the world may know that you have sent me and have loved them as you have loved me. Our love for the Lord and our love for one another is the greatest tool for evangelism that the church has been given by God. It's the greatest tool. This is the way that they will know. They will know that you are my disciples by the way that you love one another. Love one another as I have loved you. Why is love so important? Because love then is the gospel. This love is that oneness that we have with God that is to be a compelling witness to the rest of the world. There was an enemy of the church in the early church who made this confession He said, the Christians put our people to shame because the Christians will care for our dead when we won't even care for them, when we won't even touch them. There would be instances of infanticide where unwanted infants would be cast aside on the sides of the road and the Christians would come by and pick up those infants and give them a proper burial. Wow. And that kind of love was compelling to the world. I pray that as a church, that we would step up and stand up and live out this loving community of the Trinity that God has given to us to the glory of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit and to the joy of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit and the church. My prayer for today, for you. Blessings.